Various nomadic empires, including the Xiongnu (3rd century BCE to 1st century CE), the Shanbei State (c. 93 to 234 CE, the Roran Khaganate (330 to 555), the Turkic Khaganate (552 to 744), and others, ruled the area of present-day Mongolia. The Khitan people, who used a Paramongolic language, founded a state known as the Liao Dynasty in Central Asia and ruled Mongolia and portions of the present-day Russian Far East, Northern Korea, and North China. In 1206 Genghis Khan was able to unite and conquer the Mongols, forging them into a fighting force which went on to establish the largest contiguous empire in world history, the Mongol Empire 1206 Buddhism in Mongolia began with the Yuan Emperor's conversion to Tibetan Buddhism. After the collapse of the Mongol-led China-based Yuan dynasty in 1368, the Mongols returned to their earlier patterns of internal strife. The Mongols also returned to their old shamanist ways after the collapse of their empire and only in the 16th and 17th centuries did Buddhism re-emerge. At the end of the 17th century, present-day Mongolia became part of the area ruled by the Manchu-led Qing dynasty. During the collapse of the Qing in 1911, Mongolia declared independence but had to struggle until 1921 to firmly establish de facto independence and until 1945 to gain international recognition. As a consequence, Mongolia came under strong Soviet influence. In 1924, the Mongolian People's Republic was declared, and Mongolian politics began to follow the same patterns as Soviet politics of the time. After the revolutions of 1989, the Mongolian Revolution of 1990 led to a multi-party system, a new constitution in 1992, and a transition to a market economy. Prehistory The climate of Central Asia became dry after the large tectonic collision between the Indian Plate and the Eurasian Plate. This impact threw up the massive chain of mountains known as the Himalayas. The Himalayas, Greater Kingan and Lesser Kingan Mountains act like a high wall, blocking the warm and wet climate from penetrating into Central Asia. Many of the mountains of Mongolia were formed during the late Neogene and early Quaternary periods. The Mongolian climate was more humid hundreds of thousands of years ago. Mongolia is known to be the source of priceless paleontological discoveries. The first scientifically confirmed dinosaur eggs were found in Mongolia during the 1923 expedition of the American Museum of Natural History, led by Roy Chapman Andrews. During the middle to late Eocene epoch, Mongolia was the home of many paleogene mammals with Sarcastodon and Andrusarchus being the most prominent of them. Homo erectus possibly inhabited Mongolia as much as 800,000 years ago but fossils of Homo erectus have not yet been found in Mongolia. Stone tools have been found in the southern, Gobi, region, perhaps dating back as much as 800,000 years. Important prehistoric sites are the Paleolithic cave drawings of the Khoid Senkarian Agui Northern Cave of Blue in Khovd Province, and the Sagan Agui White Cave in Bayangkongar Province. A Neolithic farming settlement has been found in Dorno Province. Contemporary findings from Western Mongolia include only temporary encampments of hunters and fishers. The population during the Copper Age has been described as Paleomongolid in the east of what is now Mongolia, and as Europid in the west. The slab grave culture of the Late Bronze and Early Iron Age, related to the Proto Mongols, spread over northern, central, and eastern Mongolia. Inner Mongolia, northwest China, Xinjiang, Kilian Mountains, etc., Manchuria, Lesser Kingan, Buryatia, Irkutsk Oblast, and Zabaykalsky Krai. This culture is the main archaeological find of the Bronze Age Mongolia. Deer stones, also known as reindeer stones, and the omnipresent Karagsars small kurgans, probably are from this era. Other theories date the deer stones as 7th or 8th centuries BC. Deer stones are ancient megaliths carved with symbols that can be found all over central and eastern Eurasia, but are concentrated largely in Siberia and Mongolia. Most deer stones occur in association with ancient graves, it is believed that stones are the guardians of the dead. There are around 700 deer stones known in Mongolia of a total of 900 deer stones that have been found in Central Asia and South Siberia. Their true purpose and creators are still unknown. Some researchers claim that deer stones are rooted in shamanism and are thought to have been set up during the Bronze Age around 1000 BC, and may mark the graves of important people. 
Later inhabitants of the area likely reused them to mark their own burial mounds, and perhaps for other purposes. In Mongolia, the Lake Baikal area, and the Sion and Altai Mountains, there are 550, 20, 20, and 60 known deer stones respectively. Moreover, there are another 20 deer stones in Kazakhstan and the Middle East and 10 further west, specifically in the Ukraine and parts of the Russian Federation, including the provinces of Orenburg and the Caucasus, and near the Elbe River Mongolian History 2003. According to H. L. Halayanova, the artistic deer image originated from the Sak tribe and its branches Volkov believes that some of the methods of crafting deer stone art are closely related to Scythians Volkov 1967, whereas Mongolian archaeologist D. Savindorge regards deer stone art as having originated in Mongolia during the Bronze Age and spread thereafter to Tuva and the Baikal area Savindorge 1979. A vast Iron Age burial complex from the 5th-3rd century, later also used by the Xiongnu, has been unearthed near Alangam. Before the 20th century, some scholars assumed that the Scythians descended from the Mongolic people. The Scythian community inhabited western Mongolia in the 5-6 th century. In 2006 the mummy of a Scythian warrior, which is believed to be about 2,500 years old was a 30- to 40-year-old man with blonde hair, and was found in the Altai Mountains, Mongolia. In historical times Eurasian nomads were concentrated on the steppe lands of Central Asia. Furthermore, it is assumed that the Turkic peoples have always inhabited the western, the Mongols the central, and the Tungusic peoples the eastern portions of the region. By the 8th century BCE, the inhabitants of the western part of Mongolia evidently were nomadic Indo European migrants, either Scythians or Yuzi. In central and eastern parts of Mongolia were many other tribes that were primarily Mongol in their ethnologic characteristics. With the appearance of iron weapons by the 3rd century BCE, the inhabitants of Mongolia had begun to form clan alliances and lived a hunter and herder lifestyle. The origins of more modern inhabitants are found among the forest hunters and nomadic tribes of Inner Asia. They inhabited a great arc of land extending generally from the Korean Peninsula in the east, across the northern tier of China to present-day Kazakhstan and to the Pamir Mountains and Lake Balkish in the west. During most of recorded history, this has been an area of constant ferment from which emerged numerous migrations and invasions to the southeast into China, to the southwest into Transoxiana, modern Uzbekistan, Iran, and India, and to the west across Scythia toward Europe. Ancient period The area of modern Mongolia has been inhabited by groups of nomads since ancient times. The ancient population had a nomadic and hunter lifestyle and lived a fairly closed life. While most of Central Asia had a fairly similar nomadic lifestyle where moving in and around national boundaries and mixing with different settlements was common, the situation in the Mongolian steppes was unique because migration was limited by natural barriers such as the Altai Mountains in the west, the Gobi Desert in the south and the freezing wastelands of Siberia in the north, all unsuitable for nomadic-based living. These greatly limited migration, although they also kept out invaders. The clans in Mongolia only allied with other Mongolian clans, with which they shared the same language, religion and way of life. This would later be a huge advantage in uniting the people in Mongolia against the threat of the expanding Chinese empires. There were repeated conflicts with the Chinese dynasties of Shang and especially Zhou, which had begun conquering and enslaving the Mongolic people in an expansive drift. By the time of the Warring States period in China, the northern dynasties of Zhao, Yan, and Qin had begun to encroach and conquer into southern Mongolia. By the time the Qin dynasty had united all of China's kingdoms into one empire, the Sahin Kingdom had been formed in the Mongolian plains, transforming all of the independent clans into one single state and reassured the safety and independence from an expanding Qin. Xiongnu State 209 BC to 93 AD. The establishment of the Xiongnu Empire in Mongolia in the 3rd century BC marks the beginning of statehood on the territory of Mongolia. The identity of the ethnic core of Xiongnu has been a subject of varied hypotheses and some scholars, including Paul Pelliot and Byambin Rinchen, insisted on a Mongolic origin. The first significant appearance of nomads came late in the 3rd century BC, when the Chinese repelled an invasion of the Xiongnu in Wade Giles' romanization across the Yellow River from the Gobi. 
a Chinese army, which had adopted Xiongnu military technology wearing trousers and using mounted archers with stirrups pursued the Xiongnu across the Gobi in a ruthless punitive expedition. Fortification walls built by various Chinese warring states were connected to make a 2,300 km Great Wall along the northern border, as a barrier to further nomadic inroads. The founder of the Xiongnu Empire was Tumen. He was succeeded violently by his son Modu Shanyu, who then conquered and unified various tribes. At the peak of its power, the Xiongnu Confederacy stretched from Lake Baikal in the north to the Great Wall in the south and from the Tian Shan Mountains in the west to the Greater Qing'an Ranges in the east. In the 2nd century BC the Xiongnu turned their attention westward to the region of the Altai Mountains and Lake Balkish, inhabited by Indo-European speaking nomadic peoples, including Yuzi Yuchi and Wade Giles, who had relocated from China's present-day Gansu province as a result of their earlier defeat by the Xiongnu. Endemic warfare between these two nomadic peoples reached a climax in the latter part of the 3rd century and the early decades of the 2nd century BC, the Xiongnu were triumphant. The Yuzi then migrated to the southwest where, early in the 2nd century, they began to appear in the Oxus the modern amusement Darya Valley, to change the course of history in Bactria, Iran, and eventually India. In 200 BC, the Han dynasty of China launched a military campaign into the territory, attempting to subjugate the Xiongnu. However the Xiongnu forces ambushed and encircled the Han Emperor Gao at Baideng for seven days. Emperor Gao was forced to submit to the Xiongnu, and a treaty was signed in 198 BC recognizing all the territories to the north from the Great Wall should belong to the Xiongnu, while the territory to the south of the Great Wall should belong to the Han. In addition, China was obliged to marry princesses and pay annual tribute to the Xiongnu. This marriage alliance was far from peaceful, as Xiongnu raids into the fertile southern land never ceased. During the period of Emperor Wen, Xiongnu raids advanced into China proper, ravaged and even besieged near its capital Chang'an. This continued for 70 years until the reign of Emperor Wu, whose massive counteroffensives devastated the Xiongnu and sent them towards the road of decline. The Xiongnu again raided northern China about 200 BC, finding that the inadequately defended Great Wall was not a serious obstacle. By the middle of the 2nd century BC, they controlled all of northern and western China north of the Yellow River. This renewed threat led the Chinese to improve their defenses in the north, while building up and improving the army, particularly the cavalry, and while preparing long-range plans for an invasion of Mongolia. By 176 BC, domain of the Xiongnu was 4,030,000 square kilometers, 1,560,000 square miles in size. Xiongnu capital, Lut, Dragon, located on the Beach or Khon River, Central Mongolia, between 130 and 121 BC, Chinese armies drove the Xiongnu back across the Great Wall, weakened their hold on Gansu province as well as on what is now Inner Mongolia, and finally pushed them north of the Gobi into Central Mongolia. Following these victories, the Chinese expanded into the areas later known as Manchuria, Mongolia, the Korean Peninsula, and Inner Asia. The Xiongnu, once more turning their attention to the west and the southwest, raided deep into the Oxus Valley between 73 and 44 BC. The descendants of the Yuzi and their Chinese rulers, however, formed a common front against the Xiongnu and repelled them. During the next century, as Chinese strength waned, border warfare between the Chinese and the Xiongnu was almost incessant. Gradually the nomads forced their way back into Gansu and the northern part of what is now China's Xinjiang. In about the middle of the 1st century AD, a revitalized Eastern Han dynasty AD 25-220 slowly recovered these territories, driving the Xiongnu back into the Altai Mountains and the steppes north of the Gobi. During the late 1st century AD, having re-established the administrative control over southern China and northern Vietnam that had been lost briefly at beginning of this same century, the Eastern Han made a concerted effort to reassert dominance over Inner Asia. The concept of Mongolia as an independent power north of China is seen in the letter sent by Emperor Wen of Han to Laoshang Chanyu in 162 BC recorded in the Hanshu. The Emperor of China respectfully salutes the great Shan Yu of the Xiong Nu When my imperial predecessor erected the Great Wall, all the Bowman nations on the north were subject to the Shan Yu, while the residents inside the wall, who wore the cap and sash, were all under our government, and the myriads of the people, by following their occupations, plowing and weaving, shooting and hunting, were able to provide themselves with food and clothing. Your letter says. 
the two nations being now at peace, and the two princes living in harmony, military operations may cease, the troops may send their horses to graze, and prosperity and happiness prevail from age to age, commencing, a new era of contentment and peace. That is extremely gratifying to me. Should I, in concert with the Shan Yu, follow this course, complying with the will of heaven, then compassion for the people will be transmitted from age to age, and extended to unending generations, while the universe will be moved with admiration, and the influence will be felt by neighboring kingdoms inimical to the Chinese or the Xiong Nu. As the Xiong Nu live in the northern regions, where the cold piercing atmosphere comes at an early period, I have ordered the proper authorities to transmit yearly to the Shan Yu, a certain amount of grain, gold, silks of the finer and coarser kinds, and other objects. Now peace prevails all over the world, the myriads of the population are living in harmony, and I and the Shan Yu alone are the parents of the people. After the conclusion of the Treaty of Peace throughout the world, take notice, the Han will not be the first to transgress. The identity of the ethnic core of Zongnu has been a subject of varied hypotheses and some scholars, including A. Lovzandendev, Bernat Munkaksi, Henry Haworth, Rashbunsag, Alexei Okladnikov, Peter Pallas, Isaac Schmidt, Nikita Bicharin and Byambin Rinchen, insisted on a Mongolic origin. There are many cultural similarities between the Zongnu and Mongols such as yurt on cart, composite bow, board game, horn bow and long song. Mongolian long song is believed to date back at least 2,000 years. Mythical origin of the long song mentioned in Book of Wei, Volume 113. In 48 AD, the Zongnu Empire was weakened as it was divided into the southern and northern Zongnu. The northern Zongnu migrated to the west. They established Yuban State 160 to 490 in modern Kazakhstan and Hunnic Empire 370s minus 469 in Europe. The Shanbei that were under the Zongnu rebelled in 93 AD, ending the Zongnu domination in Mongolia. Recent excavations of Zongnu graves at the site Gol Mod in the Kherkhan of Arkhangai province, discovered bronze decorations with images of a creature resembling the unicorn and images of deities resembling the Greco-Roman deities. These discoveries lead to a hypothesis that the Zongnu had relations with the Greco-Roman world 2,000 years ago. Topic. Shanbei State 147 to 234. Although the Zongnu finally had been split into two parts in AD 48, the Shanbei or Xianpei in Wade Giles had moved apparently from the east into the region vacated by the Zongnu. The Shanbei were the northern branch of the Donghu or Tunghu, the Eastern Hu, a proto-Mongol group mentioned in Chinese histories as existing as early as the 4th century BC. The language of the Donghu is believed to be proto-Mongolic to modern scholars. The Donghu were among the first peoples conquered by the Zongnu. Once the Zongnu state weakened, however, the Donghu rebelled. By the 1st century AD, two major subdivisions of the Donghu had developed, the proto-Mongolic Shanbei in the north and the Wawan in the south. The Shanbei gained strength beginning from the 1st century AD and were consolidated into a state under Tanshawai in 147. He expelled the Zongnu from Jungaria, and pushed the Dingling to the north of the Sions, thus securing domination of the Mongolic elements in what is now Khalkha and Shaharia. The Shanbei successfully repelled an invasion of the Han dynasty in 167 and conquered areas of northern China in 180. There are various hypotheses about the language and ethnic links of the Shanbei and most widely accepted version suggests that the Shanbei were a Mongolic ethnic group and their branches are the ancestors of many Mongolic peoples such as the Roran, Khitan and Mengu Zaibei, who are suggested to be the proto-Mongols. The ruler of the Shanbei state was elected by a congress of the nobility. The Shanbei used woodcut tallies called kemu as a form of non-verbal communication. Besides extensive livestock husbandry, the Shanbei were also engaged on a limited scale in farming and handicraft. The Shanbei fractured in the 3rd century. The Shanbei established an empire, which, although short-lived, gave rise to numerous tribal states along the Chinese frontier. Among these states was that of the Toba Topa in Wade Giles, a subgroup of the Shanbei, in modern China's Shaanxi province. The Wuhan also were prominent in the 2nd century, but they disappeared thereafter, possibly they were absorbed in the Shanbei western expansion. The Shanbei and the Wuhan used mounted archers in warfare, and they had only temporary war leaders instead of hereditary chiefs. 
Agriculture, rather than full-scale nomadism, was the basis of their economy. In the 6th century, the Wuan were driven out of Inner Asia into the Russian steppe. Chinese control of parts of Inner Asia did not last beyond the opening years of the 2nd century AD, and, as the Eastern Han dynasty ended early in the 3rd century AD, suzerainty was limited primarily to the Gansu Corridor. The Shanbei were able to make forays into a China beset with internal unrest and political disintegration. By 317 all of China north of the Yangtze River had been overrun by nomadic peoples, the Shanbei from the north, some remnants of the Xiongnu from the northwest, and the Chang people of Gansu and Tibet present-day China's Qizang Autonomous Region from the west and the southwest. Chaos prevailed as these groups warred with each other and repulsed the vain efforts of the fragmented Chinese kingdoms south of the Yangtze River to reconquer the region. Tuba, a faction of the Shanbei, established the Tuba Wei Empire beyond Mongolia proper in northern China in 386. By the end of the 4th century, the region between the Yangtze and the Gobi, including much of modern Xinjiang, was dominated by the Tuba. Emerging as the partially Sinicized state of Dai between AD 338 and 376 in the Shaanxi area, the Tuba established control over the region as the Northern Wei AD 386 to 533. Northern Wei armies drove back the Roran also referred to as Ruru or Wan Wan by Chinese chroniclers, a newly arising nomadic Mongol people in the steppes north of the Altai Mountains, and reconstructed the Great Wall. During the 4th century also, the Huns left the steppes north of the Aral Sea to invade Europe. By the middle of the 5th century, Northern Wei had penetrated into the Tarim Basin in Inner Asia, as had the Chinese in the 2nd century. As the empire grew, however, Tuba tribal customs were supplanted by those of the Chinese, an evolution not accepted by all Tuba. Tuba Wei existed until 581. Topic: <laughs> Roran State 330 to 555. A branch of the Shanbei, the Roran, also known as Niran, were consolidated under Mughalyu. In the late 5th century, the Roran established a powerful nomadic empire spreading generally farther north of Northern Wei. It was probably the Roran who first used the title Khan. The Roran ruled Mongolia, eastern Kazakhstan, part of Gansu, northern Xinjiang, Inner Mongolia, parts of northeastern China and southern Siberia. The Hephthalite Empire was a vassal state to the Roran for 100 years. Shellin assumed the title of Kagan in 402 landmarking the establishment of the state of the Roran Khaganate. The Tuba waged long wars against the Roran Khaganate. The Altai Turkics that were subjects of the Roran revolted in 552 establishing the Turkic Khaganate. The Roran Khaganate was finally defeated by the Turkics in 555. Part of the Roran left the present territory of Mongolia. A number of historians maintain that they established the Avarian Khaganate between the river Danube and the Carpathian Mountains. The Rorans that stayed in Mongolia became the ancestors of the Tatar tribes. The Tatars and other Mongol tribes lived in the eastern part Mongolia during the Turkic period. Other Mongols that migrated east returned in the 8th century. Topic: <laughs> Turkic period 555 to 840. Topic: Turkic Khaganate 552 to 630, 682 to 744, Tang China 630 to 682. Northern Wei was disintegrating rapidly because of revolts of semi-tribal Tuba military forces that were opposed to being Sinicized, When disaster struck the flourishing Roran Khaganate. The Altai Turkics or Kone Turkics, Gokturks, known as Tuju to Chinese chroniclers, were subjects to the Roran and served as blacksmiths for them. In 552 AD the Gokturks revolted against their Roran rulers. The uprising began in the Altai Mountains, where many of the Turk were serfs working the iron mines. Therefore, the revolt of the Turkics of 552 is often called the Blacksmiths' Rebellion. The uprising was headed by Buman, who became the founder of the Gokturk Khaganate. Thus, from the outset of their revolt, they had the advantage of controlling what had been one of the major bases of Roran power. Between 546 and 553, the Turks overthrew the Roran and established themselves as the most powerful force in Central Asia. The Chinese dynasties Qi and Zhou surrendered in 570 and began paying tribute to the Gokturks. 
However, the newly established Sui dynasty in China 581 stopped and so constant war between Sui and the Turkic Khaganate began. Turk was partitioned in 583 into an eastern and western Turkic Khaganates by the plot made by Sui dynasty of China. Finally in 584 Eastern Turk recognized Sui suzerainty. Turkic Khaganate began to revolt and hasten the border in 615 after Emperor of Sui's failure expedition in Kogoryo. The internal struggle between the Turkic nobles lead to their defeat by the Tang dynasty of China in 630. From 629 to 648, a reunited China, under the Tang Dynasty, 618 to 906, destroyed the power of the Eastern Turk north of the Gobi, established suzerainty over the Khitan, a semi-nomadic paramongolic people who lived in areas that became the modern Chinese provinces of Heilongjiang and Jilin, and established the Anbei Protectorate in the Mongolian steppes. Uyghurs Khagan was installed as Anbei Protector, who inhabited the region between the Altai Mountains and Khitan's land. Between 641 and 648, the Tang conquered the Western Turk, re-establishing Chinese sovereignty over Xinjiang and exacting tribute from west of the Pamir Mountains. The Gokturks continuously struggled against the subjugation by the Tang dynasty started in 679. An uprising of 682 under the leadership of Kutulik and Tonyukik led to restoration of the Turkic Khaganate. For a brief period at the beginning of the 7th century, a new consolidation of the Turk, under the Western Turk ruler Tardu, again threatened China. In 701 Tardu's army besieged Chang'an modern Xi'an, then the capital of China. Tardu was turned back, however, and, upon his death two years later, the Turk state again fragmented. The Eastern Turk nonetheless continued their depredations, occasionally threatening Chang'an. In the early 8th century, an invading army of 450,000 soldiers headed by Tang Dynasty's Empress Wu Zetian was defeated and chased back by Mojo Kagan. The Turk Empire finally ended in 744 by the joint Chinese, Uyghur and other nomadic forces. <laughs> Uyghur state 744 The Uyghurs, who were subjects to the Gokturks, revolted in 745 and founded the Uyghur Khaganate which replaced the Eastern Turkic Khaganate. The Uyghur Khagan Bayanchor established Ordu Balak city on the Orkhon River in 751. The Tang Empire invited the Uyghurs to subdue the Anlutian Rebellion in 755. Successful campaigns of the Uyghur Khaganate led to a peace with the Tang Dynasty of China which paid compensation for the suppression of an in silk and grain for 12 years after 766. Though a faction of the Uyghurs were Buddhists, the Manichaeism became the official religion of the Khaganate in the 8th century. Nevertheless, the majority of the Uyghurs remained shamanists. The culture and economy of the Uyghur Khaganate were more advanced than those of its predecessors. The Uyghurs used a 12-month calendar and calculated the dates of solar and lunar eclipses. The Uyghurs developed their own writing system based on the Sogdian script. The Tang dynasty surreptitiously encouraged the Yenisei Kyrgyz and the Karluks to attack the Uyghurs and the Uyghur Khaganate fell under an invasion of the Yenisei Kyrgyz in 840. The destruction of Uyghur Khaganate by Yenisei Kyrgyzs resulted in the end of Turkic dominance in Mongolia. According to historians, Kyrgyz were not interested in assimilating newly acquired lands. The Kyrgyz state was centered on Caucasia. Topic: <laughs> Khitan State 906-1125. The Khitans were an ethnic group whose language was related to the Mongolic languages. Its ruler Ambagyan founded the Khitan Liao dynasty in 907. The Liao dynasty covered a significant portion of what is now Mongolia including the basins of the three rivers Kurlan, Tul and Orkhon. The Khitans occupied the areas vacated by the Turkic Uyghurs bringing them under their control. The Liao dynasty soon grew strong and occupied parts of northern China, including the modern-day Beijing. By 925 the Khitan ruled eastern Mongolia, most of Manchuria, and much of China north of the Yellow River. By the middle of the 10th century, Khitan chieftains had established themselves as emperors of northern China, their rule was known as the Liao dynasty. The Khitan built cities and exerted dominion over their agricultural subjects as a means of consolidating their empire. The territory of the empire consisted of two parts, one populated by pastoral herders in the north and the other populated by croppers in the south. 
The two parts of the empire actively traded with each other. Lubugu, a grandson of Ambagyan, and a scholar named Tulubu developed a grand alphabet based on the Chinese hieroglyphics in 920. Later, Tela, a son of Ambagyan, developed a minor alphabet based on the Uyghur script. A printing technology developed in the Liao territory. The Khitan language was widely studied abroad. A Tungusic people, the Yurchin, ancestors of the Manchu, formed an alliance with the Song dynasty and reduced the Liao dynasty to vassal status in a seven-year war 1115 the Yurchin leader proclaimed himself the founder of a new era, the Jin dynasty 1115 Scarcely pausing in their conquests, the Yurchin subdued neighboring Goryeo Korea in 1226 citation needed and invaded the territory of their former allies, the Song, to precipitate a series of wars with China that continued through the remainder of the century. The Liao dynasty fell in 1125 and some Khitans fled west after their defeat by the Yurchins and founded the Kara Kitai in present-day Xinjiang and eastern Kazakhstan with capital in Balasagan, near modern Tokmak, Kyrgyzstan. In addition, the western Liao also controlled some highly autonomous vassalized states, such as Khwarezm, the eastern and the western Kara Khanids, etc. In 1218, Genghis Khan destroyed the Kara Kitai, after which the Khitan passed into obscurity. The modern-day minority of Mongolic-speaking Doors in China are their direct descendants based on DNA evidence and other Khitans assimilated into the Mongols Southern Mongols, Turkic peoples and Han Chinese. <inaudible> <inaudible> medieval period Confederations and Khanates in the 12th century 12th century Mongolia was characterized by rivalry between many tribes and confederations or Khanate. A confederation of tribes under the name Mongol was known from the 8th century. Some Shiwei tribes, though little is known, have been considered the ancestors of the Mongols according to ancient Chinese records. Term. Shiwei was an umbrella term of the Mongolic and Tungusic peoples in the 6th to 12th centuries. During the 5th century, they occupied the area east of the Greater Kingan Range, what is the Hulan Bir, Argan or Gun, Nen Nun, Middle Amur, and the Ziya watersheds. They may have been divided into 5 to 20 tribes. They were said to be dressed in fish skins. They may have been nomadic, staying in the marshy lowlands in the winter and the mountains during the summer. The burial was by exposure in trees. Their language is described as being similar to Manchu Tungusic languages and Khitan. The Turkic Khaganate installed Tudans, or governors over the Shiwei and collected tribute. Other Shiwei may have stayed and become the Evenks. The Khitans conquered the Shiwei during the late 9th century. One Shiwei tribe, living near the Amur and Urgun rivers, was called the Mengu Mongol. The confederations of core Mongol tribes were transforming into a statehood in the early 12th century and came to be known as the Kamag Mongol Confederacy. The people of Mongolia at this time were predominantly spirit worshippers, with shamans providing spiritual and religious guidance to the people and tribal leaders. The Kamag Mongols occupied one of the most fertile areas of the country the basins of the rivers Onan, Kurlan, and Tul in the Kenti Mountains. The first known Khan of Kamag Mongol is Kabul Khan from Kiad tribe. Kabul Khan successfully repelled the invasions of Jin dynasty. He was succeeded by Ambagai Khan from Taichud tribe. Ambagai was captured by the Tatars while he came to deliver his daughter as a bride to the Tatar confederacy and was given to the Yurchins of Jin dynasty who cruelly executed him, nailing to a wooden donkey. Ambagai was succeeded by Hotula Khan, son of Kabul Khan. Hotula Khan engaged in 13 battles with the Tatars endeavoring to avenge Ambagai Khan. Kamag Mongol was unable to elect a Khan after Hotula died. However, Kabul's grandson Yesuke Bagadar was a major chief of Kamag Mongol. Yesuke was poisoned by the Tatars in 1171 when his eldest son Temujin was nine years old. Shortly after Yesuke died, Targudai of Taichud moved away with the subjects of Yesuke, leaving young Temujin, his mother and his younger siblings without support. Hence, Kamag Mongol remained in political crisis until 1189. In the 12th century the Kamag Mongol Khanate, Tatar Confederation, Karaiti Khanate, Merkit Confederation, Naiman Khanate were five major Mongolic tribal confederations and Khanates in the Mongolian Plateau. 
The Tatar Confederacy first appeared in recorded history in 732. The Tatars became subjects of the Khitan in the 10th century. After the fall of the Khitan Empire, the Tatars experienced pressure from the Jin dynasty and were urged to fight against the other Mongol tribes. The Tatars lived on the fertile pastures around the lakes Hulan and Buir and occupied a trade route to China. The Karet between the mountain ranges of Kongai and Kenti were centered on the site of today's city Ulaanbaatar in the willow groves of the Tul River. Marcus was Khan of the Karet in the 12th century. Marcus was succeeded by Toral Khan. In his feud with his brothers for the throne of the Karet, he was repeatedly aided by Yesuke Bagator of Kamag Mongol. The Merged Confederacy was located in the basin of the river Selenj. The Hori Tumeds and Buryats lived around the lake Baikal. The Naaman Confederacy was situated between the mountain ranges of Altai and Kongai. The Ongat tribes lived at the north of Gobi. Other tribes were Olkanut, Bayad, Kongarid, Orats and so forth. While most of the Mongolian tribes were shamanists, Nestorian Christianity was practiced in a number of confederations such as Karet and Ongat. Topic. Consolidation of the Mongol state Temujin defeated and subjugated the three Mergids in 1189 with the support of Toral Khan of Karait, the blood brother of his father. Another ally who helped Temujin in this venture was his own blood brother Jamuka of Jadaran clan. The Mergids had attacked the home of Temujin and captured his wife Borte of Hanjarad tribe revenging for a much earlier event in which Temujin's father Yesuke deprived a Mergid chief Chilidiu his bride Holan of Olkanut tribe, who became the mother of Temujin. The striving of Temujin to free his wife became a reason for the campaign against the Mergids. After the defeat of the Mergid, the reputation of Temujin rose rapidly and the leading members of the Kamag Mongol aristocracy enthroned him with title Chinggis Khan, Genghis Khan as the ruler of Kamag Mongol. It is speculated to be an ancient form of the word, Tengis. Ocean, sea. A conflict of the Tatars with the Jin dynasty became a favorable opportunity for Temujin and Toral Khan to defeat them in alliance with the Yurchins. At this point, Toral Khan was granted the title Wang, Wang Chinese for King, by the Jin court and since then became known as Wang Khan. By the year 1201, the Taichud and Yurkan tribes were defeated and subjugated. Influential aristocrats of many other tribes and confederations were joining Temujin. In 1201, a crisis ignited in the Karaiti Kanlig, in which the siblings of Toral Wang Khan allied with Anansha Khan of Naaman and defeated Toral. Wang Khan regained power in his kingdom with the support of Temujin. Temujin finally defeated and subjugated the Tatars in 1202. Nila Sengam, son of Wang Khan, envied Temujin as his power was growing and persuaded his father to battle against Temujin. This venture led to a victory of Temujin and conquest of the Karait Kanlik. Wang Khan escaped alone into the southern deserts of the Naaman Kanlig, where he was caught by the Naaman patrols, who killed him irritated as he claimed himself as Wang Khan. Tayan Khan of Naaman and his son Kukulug initiated a campaign against Temujin in 1204. They allied with Jamuka, who competed with Temujin for the power over the Mongolic tribes. The Naaman troops outnumbered the Temujin's troops. At night at the eve of the battle, Temujin ordered each of his warrior to light ten bonfires, thus deceiving and demoralizing Tayan Khan, who was a weak warlord. Temujin won the battle. Tayan Khan was captured but died of his wound. Kukulug retreated to the river Irtish where he was overtaken by Temujin and defeated. After this battle, Kukulug escaped to Gur Khan of Karakatai. As the Kanlik of Naaman was conquered, Kassar, brother of Temujin, found a dignitary named Tata Tunga, who spread the Uyghur alphabet among the Mongols. This alphabet became the basis of the classical Mongol script. By 1206, all the tribes and confederations of Mongolian steppe had come under the leadership of Temujin. The success of Temujin in consolidation of the Mongols was due to his flexibility, his cherishing of his friends and his elaborated tactics. A congress of the Mongol aristocrats on the river Onan in 1206 enthroned Temujin as Chinggis Khan, Genghis Khan as emperor of all Mongolia. Topic. Formation of the Mongol Empire The Mongol Empire and the states that emerged from it played a major role in the history of the 13th and 14th centuries. 
Genghis Khan and his immediate successors conquered nearly all of Asia and European Russia and sent armies as far as Central Europe and Southeast Asia. Genghis Khan abolished the organization of the former tribes and confederations and reformed the country into 95 Mingats. In this system, a group of households large enough to mobilize ten warriors was organized into an Arbatu, ten Arbatus were organized into a Zagutu 100 warriors, ten Zagutus constituted a Mingat 1,000 warriors, and ten Mingats constituted a Tumetu or Tuman 10,000 warriors. This decimal system was a long-tested system that had been inherited from the period of the Xiongnu. With an assumption that each household consisted of four persons and every adult male was a warrior, it can be estimated that the entire population of Mongolia was at least 750,000 people and the nation possessed 95,000 cavalrymen. The newly unified Great Mongol State became an attractive force for many neighboring peoples and kingdoms. Beginning from 1207, the Uyghur state, Taiga people of the River Yenisi and the Karlik Kingdom joined Mongolia. The urgent task of Genghis Khan was strengthening the independence of his young nation. For a century, the southeastern neighbor Jin dynasty had been provoking the Mongolic tribes against one another in order to eventually subjugate them. With a purpose of testing the military strength of his state and preparing for a struggle against the Jin dynasty, Genghis Khan conquered the Tangut Empire Shi Sha, which pledged vassalage. In the year, Mongolia, with over 90,000 cavalrymen, started a war with the Jin dynasty which had a multi-million population. At this stage, the Mongols passed over the Great Wall, invaded Shaanxi and Shandong provinces, and approached the river Yellow River. The Altan Golden Khan Jin Emperor surrendered in 1214 and gave Genghis Khan his princess and tribute of gold and silver to his warlords. Genghis Khan gave out to his warriors the tribute of the Jin Emperor loaded on 3,000 horses. However, the Jin dynasty continued hostility against Mongolia, hence Genghis Khan ordered his warlord Guo Wang Mukulai of the Jalair clan to complete the conquest of the Jin dynasty and return to Mongolia. Later, the warlord Jeeb of Besid clan defeated Kachulug who had become the Gur Khan of Kara Kitai. His power was weak as he, a Buddhist, persecuted the indigenous Muslim population. Genghis Khan intended to develop friendly relations with the Khwarezm Empire, which was on a junction of the trade routes connecting the East and the West and dominated Central Asia, Iran and Afghanistan. Genghis Khan considered himself a supreme ruler of the East and Khwarezm Shah a supreme ruler of the West. Khwarezm Shah had an opposite view that there should be only one ruler on earth as there is only one sun in the sky. The execution of 450 envoys and tradesmen of Genghis Khan by Khwarezm Shah 1218 was an announcement of war. The Mongol troops invaded Khwarezm Empire in 1219. Although Khwarezm Shah possessed an army outnumbering the Mongol troops dozen of times, he lacked the courage and initiatives to unite his forces and fight back. The Mongol troops sacked cities Otrar, Bihara, Merv and Samarkand. Shah's warlord Timur Melik led a daring resistance when the Mongol troops besieged city of Kujand. Shah's son Jalal ad-Din Mingburnu courageously battled with the Mongol army in 1221, but was defeated and escaped to the river Ind. Pursuing Khwarezm Shah in 1220, the scout groups of warlords Jeeb and Subade Bagathar of Uriankai clan conquered northern Iran. They invaded Iraq, Azerbaijan, Armenia and Georgia in 1221 and entered the territories of the Kipchak Khanate in Crimea and grasslands of the northern Black Sea. The Kipchaks allied with the troops of the principalities of Rus gave battle to the 30,000 cavalrymen of Jeeb and Subade on the river Kalka in May 1223, but were defeated and were chased up to the river Dnieper. The Tangut Kingdom denied its obligation as a vassal state to take part in the western campaign of Genghis Khan. Shortly after returning to Mongolia, the Mongol army invaded the Tangut state in 1226 and conquered the capital Zongxing, Zhongxing Fu located in modern Yinchuan. The Tangut kingdom completely surrendered in March 1227. Mongolic Khitans and Tuyuhuns or Mongar people 1227 came under rule of the Mongol Empire after conquest of the Tanghut's western Shah and Tungusic Jin empires. The Kara Kitai was conquered by the Mongols under Genghis Khan in 1218. The sixteen-year conquests of Genghis Khan resulted in the formation of the Mongol Empire. He died on 16 August 1227 and was buried at site Ihe Otog on the southern slopes of the Kenti mountain range. <laughs> <laughs> Mongol Empire and Pax Mongolica. 
The 1228 Congress of Nobility known as Kuril Tai enthroned Ogede, who had been nominated by Genghis Khan. Ogede Khan made Karakoram on the river or Khon the capital of the Mongol Empire. Karakoram had been a military garrison of Genghis Khan since 1220. The existence of twelve Buddhist temples, two Muslim mosques and one Christian church in city Karakoram indicates the tolerance of the Mongols to all religions. The construction of the city was supervised by Achigan, the youngest brother of Genghis Khan. Ogede Khan established an effective postal yam system with well-organized posts The system connected the various regions of the whole empire. Ogede Khan settled down the rebellions in the countries conquered during his father and led an army himself to put down a revolt in Korea. Ogede Khan completed the conquest of the Jin dynasty in 1231-1234. He sent princes headed by Batu, son of Zuki, to the west, and they conquered the Bulgar kingdom on the Volga River and fourteen principalities of Rus in 1236–1240, invaded the principalities of Poland, the Kingdom of Kingdom of Hungary, Moravia then part of the Holy Roman Empire, and the area of Moldavia in 1241–1242 and approached the Adriatic Sea. After his sixteen-year reign, Ogede Khan died in 1241 under suspicious circumstances. A rivalry for the throne began between the faction of the houses of Zuki and Tului on one side and the faction of the houses of Chagatai and Ogede on the other side. The Kirilte of 1246 elected Gaiag, son of Ogede, as Great Khan. Gaiag Khan died in 1248. The traveller from Italy Giovanni da Pian del Carpine arrived in 1246 and later he wrote the book Historia Mongolorum quas nos Tartaros Apelimus. The faction of Zuki Tului houses won the Kirilte of 1251 electing Manj, son of Tului, as Great Khan. Manj Khan sent his second younger brother Hulagu to conquer Iran. Hulagu completed the conquest of Iran in 1256 and conquered Baghdad, Caucasus and Syria in 1257-1259. Willem van Ruysbroek of Flanders arrived in 1254 and later wrote his account Itinerarium Fratris Williami de Rubrici de Orden Fratrum Minorum, Galli, Anno Gratia 1253 ad partes orientales. Manj Khan died in 1259, without leaving behind a son. The Kirilte of 1260 elected Ariq Bok, the youngest brother of Manj Khan, as Great Khan. The same year, Manj Khan's first younger brother Kublai, who was warring in China to conquer the Song dynasty, elevated himself into Great Khan in city Shangdu or known as Kaiping. The Tuluid civil war was fought between the two brothers from 1261 to 1264 until Ariq Bok surrendered. The Mongol Empire had an establishing effect on the social, cultural and economic life of the inhabitants of the vast Eurasian territory in the 13th and 14th centuries. It enabled exchange of knowledge, inventions and culture between the West and East. This epoch is called Pax Mongolica. In Mongolia, the legacy of Genghis Khan was a superior law code, a written language, and a historical pride. Topic. Fragmentation of the Mongol Empire and Yuan rule The establishment of the Yuan dynasty 1271 by Kublai Khan accelerated the fragmentation of the Mongol Empire. The Mongol Empire fractured into four khanates including the Yuan dynasty in China and Mongolia, and the three western khanates, i.e. the Golden Horde, the Chagatai Khanate and the Ilkhanate, although later Yuan emperors were seen as the nominal suzerains of the western khanates. The transition of the capital of the Mongol Empire from Karakoram to Kanbalik Dadu, modern-day Beijing by Kublai Khan in 1264 was opposed by many Mongols. Thus, Ariq Bok's struggle was for keeping the center of the empire in Mongolia homeland. After Ariq Bok's death, the struggle was continued by Kaidu, a grandson of Ogede Khan and de facto ruler of the Chagatai Khanate until 1301 as well as Lord Nayan in 1287, although the Mongolian steppe was controlled by Kublai Khan and his successors after the Tuluid Civil War. Kublai invited Lama Drogon Chogyal Phagpa of Sakya school of Tibetan Buddhism to spread Buddhism throughout his realm the second introduction of Buddhism among the Mongols. Buddhism became the de facto state religion of the Mongol Yuan state. In 1269, Kublai Khan commissioned Phagpa Lama to design a new writing system to unify the writing systems of the multilingual empire. The Phag's Pa script, also known as the Square Script, 
was based on the Tibetan script and written vertically from top was designed to write in Mongolian, Tibetan, Chinese, Uyghur and Sanskrit languages and served as the official script of the empire. Kublai Khan announced the establishment of the Yuan dynasty in 1271. The Yuan dynasty included Mongolia homeland, the territories of the former Jin and Song dynasties and some adjacent territories such as a major part of southern Siberia. Kublai established a government with institutions resembling the ones in earlier Chinese dynasties such as the Zongshu Sheng to lead the civil administration in the Yuan realm, yet at the same time introduced a hierarchy of reliability by dividing the subjects of the Yuan dynasty into four ranks. The highest rank included the Mongols, the second rank included the peoples to the west of Mongolia, the third rank included the subjects of the former Jin dynasty such as Northern Chinese, the Khitans and Yurchins, and the lowest rank comprised the subjects of the former Song dynasty such as the Han ethnic group in South China. As for Mongolia itself, since the Mongolian plateau is where the ruling Mongols of the Yuan dynasty came from, it enjoyed a somewhat special status during the Mongol Yuan dynasty, although the capital of the dynasty had been moved from Karakoram to Kanbalik modern Beijing since the beginning of Kublai Khan's reign, and Mongolia had been turned into a province known as the Lingbai branch secretariat by the early 14th century. After the capture of the Yuan capital by the Ming dynasty founded by Han Chinese in 1368, the last Yuan emperor Tan Timur fled north to Chengdu, then to Yingchang and died there in 1370. The Mongols under his son and successor Bailigtu Khan Ayushiradara retreated to the Mongolian steppe and fought against the Ming. Mongolia homeland became the ruling center of the northern Yuan dynasty which would last until the 17th century. Northern Yuan and Four Orat By 1368 the Mongols who established the Yuan dynasty a century ago had been expelled from China to Mongolia. The Dongxiangs, Bonans, Uyghur and Mongar people came under rule of Chinese Ming dynasty. The Mongol regime after this time until the 17th century is often referred to as the Northern Yuan Dynasty, or the Forty and the Four, Dakan Driven Hoer meaning the Forty Tumans of the Mongols and the Four Tumans of the Orats. Bailigtu Khan Ayushiradara was enthroned in 1370 after the death of the last Yuan Emperor. The Ming Dynasty founded by native Chinese began aggressions against Mongolia-based Northern Yuan from the year 1372. Mongol warlord Koke Timur defeated a 150,000 Ming force on the river Orkhon in 1373. Ming army invaded Mongolia again in 1380 and looted Karakoram and other cities, but the invasions of Mongolia by Ming armies in 1381 and 1392 were expelled. Nevertheless, Yuan royalists in Yunnan had surrendered to the Ming dynasty by the early 1380s. Naghechu, a Mongol commander of Ayushiradara in Liaoyang province, invaded Laodong with aims of restoring the Yuan dynasty. However, he, along with his troops sized about 200,000 finally surrendered to the Ming dynasty in 1387-88 after a successful diplomacy of the latter. Ming China sent Kifu's cavalry into Mongolia, but was chased out by Bayan Shri Khan 1405-1412. In response, the Yongle Emperor of Ming China personally invaded Mongolia in 1409, 1414, 1422, 1423, and 1424. Mongols remained powerful even after the fall of the Yuan dynasty but number of the Mongols decreased due to the fall of the Mongol Empire, wars and assimilation Turkization. As the Ming dynasty understood its own disability of conquering Mongolia by military force, it started a policy of provoking the groups of Mongols to quarrel with one another, as well as economic blockade. A long period of feudal separatism and rivalry for the Khan's throne started in Mongolia by the early 15th century. The military strength of the Mongols during the Yuan dynasty was that they were able to mobilize an army of 400,000 warriors. 40 tumans. Assuming that an average household consisted of four people and every adult man was a warrior, it can be estimated that the Mongol population in the Yuan dynasty counted at least 1,600,000 people. However, the amount of 40 tumans remained only in the name of the Mongols after the fall of the Yuan dynasty as only six tumans were able to retreat to Mongolia and the remaining 34 tumans were lost to the Chinese Ming dynasty. These six Tumans were grouped into the three Tumans of the left wing ruled by the Mongol Khan and the three Tumans of the right wing ruled by Jinong, vassal of the Khan. 
There were about 250,000 Mongols staying in South China and many of these Mongols who were unable to retreat to Mongolia were killed by the Chinese. The Orats constituted another four Tumans. They stayed in Mongolia proper during the Yuan dynasty and cited Ariq Bok, Kaidu and Nyan in their anti-Kublai struggle. By the 15th century the Orats occupied the Altai Mountains region. The Orats were ruled by a Taishi who was a vassal of the Khan. The first half of the 15th century saw a rivalry of Orat Taishis for the throne of the Khan and the second half of the 15th century saw a separatist movement of the Taishis in the right-wing Tumans. In the late 14th century Mongolia was divided into two parts, Western Mongolia Orats and Eastern Mongolia Khalka, Southern Mongols, Barga, Buryats. Western Mongolian Orats and Eastern Mongolian Khalkas vied for domination in Mongolia since the 14th century and this conflict weakened Mongolian strength. In 1434, Eastern Mongolian Taisun Khans Prime Minister Western Mongolian Togun Taish reunited the Mongols after killing Eastern Mongolian another king Adai Togun died in 1439 and his son Asen Taish became Prime Minister. Togun Taishi of Orat eventually increased his power in the Mongol court and these achievements were tightened under his successor Asen Taishi. Mongolia was effectively unified under the power of the Orat Taishi. Asen Taishi led active diplomatic exchanges with Ming China to achieve favorable trading conditions. When diplomacy failed to reach the goal, he led a military campaign in 1449, in which a 500,000 Ming army was defeated by a 20,000 Orat army, the Ming emperor was captured and Beijing was besieged. Shortly after this event Asen Taishi defeated the nominal Khan Togtoba in their conflict and became a self-declared Khan. During his retreat, Togtoba was caught and assassinated by his ex-father-in-law for an earlier humiliation of his daughter as she was divorced and returned to her parents. The reign of Asen Taishi was short, less than a year. His rivals rebelled and overthrew him in 1454. The Khalkha emerged during the reign of Dayan Khan (1479–1543) as one of the six Tumans of the Eastern Mongolic peoples. They quickly became the dominant Mongolic clan in Mongolia proper. Mongolia was once again unified under Queen Mandukai the Wise and Batmonk Dayan Khan, who subdued the Taishis. Queen Manduai defeated the Orats when Batmunk was still a child. Later Batmunk subdued the Taishis of the right wings as they refused to accept a suzerain over them. Son of Dayan Khan sent there as a Jinong. After this event, Batmunk moved his residence from Khalkha to Shaharia, to a proxime neighborhood to the right wings for tighter control over them. Since then, the Mongol Khans resided in Shaharia up to 1634. The left-wing Tumans under Dayan Khan were Khalkha, Shaharia and Urianhai, and the right-wing Tumans were Ordos, Tumd, Yunshiyibu and Karchan, Korchan. Dayan Khan was succeeded by Badi Ala Khan whose power was however assumed by his uncle Bars Balud Jinong as a regent due to the Khan's young age. As he grew up, Badi Ala claimed back his throne and the Jinong yielded. The Mongols voluntarily reunified during Eastern Mongolian Tuman Zasakt Khan rule (1558–1592) for last time after the Mongol Empire. During the reign of Daryisung Gading Khan and his successor Tuman Jasigtu Khan, the right wings rose in the 16th century under a local lord Alton, son of Bars Bola Jinong, who assumed the title of Khan. In order to maintain the unity of the country by peaceful means, Tuman Jasigtu Khan initiated a representative government with equal participation of the representatives of the left and right wings. The right wings rivaled with the Orats for possession of Upper Mongolia and Alton Khan, who appointed his son as a ruler of Upper Mongolia Kukunor, defeated the Orats in 1552. Alton Khan attacked Ming China, but he stopped the raids in 1571, and signed a peace treaty with the Ming court. To achieve favorable conditions in the peace treaty with the Ming dynasty, Alton Khan occasionally threatened that he may ally with Tuman Khan to attack China. Alton Khan established the city of Hohat in 1557. Hututai Sesan Hongtaiji of Ordos defeated the Torgats at the river Irtish around the 1560s. Abtai Sain Khan, the ruler of Khalkha, conquered the Orats in the 1570s, but the latter rebelled in 1588. The Orats, in turn, were busy in struggle with Mogulistan for trade routes. Tuman Jasigtu Khan was succeeded by Buyan II Khan who claimed having possessed the seal of the ancient Taizong Khan. Buyan's grandson Ligdan ascended the throne in 1603. 
He initiated translation of major Buddhist scriptures into the Mongolian language. By his time, the authority of the Mongolian Khan had declined to such a degree that Legden Hututu Khan came to be known as Khan of Shaharia. The failure of his attempts of unification of Mongolia by peaceful means led him to shift to forceful methods. However, this in turn alienated the local lords of Inner Mongolia from him even farther. The striving of the Mongols to improve their life led naturally to an increase in the number of their livestock. In the extensive livestock husbandry, on which the medieval Mongolian economy was based, an excess number of livestock required either expansion of the pastures, which may imply conquest of new territories, or exchange of the excess animals and livestock products for products of settled civilizations unavailable in the unsophisticated Mongolian economy. For example, they would be able to wear clothes made of hides and wool in cold seasons, but would certainly need clothes from silk or light fabric in summer. However, the ban on trade with the Mongols by the Ming administration was a reason for armed conflicts. Moreover, there were frequent attempts to offer low prices for the livestock products or to supply low-quality reject goods to the Mongols. Thus in protest, there were cases that Mongol traders burned their reject Chinese purchases in front of the Ming officials during the rule of Asin. Also the Ming administration often issued extremely low import quotas for trade. They banned selling metal products to the Mongols in suspicion that metal would be remolded into weapons, however, metal products such as kettles were vitally important in the everyday life of the herders. Cities in Mongolia were completely destroyed during Chinese raids in the late 14th and early 15th centuries. The Ming Empire attempted to invade Mongolia in the 14-16th centuries, however, the Ming Empire was defeated by the Orat, Southern Mongol, Eastern Mongol and United Mongolian armies. Thus there was no division of labor between urban and rural economies that was characteristic in other cultures. Some attempts of diversification of the economy were undertaken in the 16th and 17th centuries in peripheral Mongol domains but not in northern Khalkha. Thus Alton Khan made Chinese grow grain around the city of Hohat. Erdeni Bachur Hongtaiji attempted to develop cereal and horticulture production in Dzungaria using imported Kazakhs, Kyrgyz, Chinese and Taranchais. However, these initiatives mainly or exclusively served the ruling classes and the mass of the Mongol commoners received little or no benefit from them. By the end of the 16th century, several Kanlig dynasties developed in Khalkha. As Dayan Khan divided Mongolia among his eleven sons, northern Khalkha approximately the territory of modern Mongolia was given to his youngest son Gerson's Hongtaiji and southern Khalkha was given to Alkabolad. Northern Khalkha was further divided among Gerson's seven sons and their sons. Abtai, the most powerful of Gerson's grandchildren, received the title of Khan from the Dalai Lama, and his son Ariyei Mergen Khan founded the dynasty of the Tushietu Khans, who ruled the central heartland of northern Khalkha. Gerson's great-grandson Sholoi solicited the title of Khan from Dalai Lama during his visit to Tibet and initiated the dynasty of Sesan Khans in the east of Khalkha. Another great-grandson of Gerson's Lahore assumed the title of Khan, and his son Sumbadai founded the dynasty of the Zasigtu Khans, ruling the west of northern Khalkha. Lahore's cousin Yubashi Hongtaiji separated from the Zasigtu Khan and initiated the dynasty of Alton Khans of Khotgoid. The title Alton Khan was given to him by the Russian authorities. In the beginning of the 17th century, the Koshit tribe of Orat migrated to Kakunor, and Torgats migrated to the basin of the river Volga, becoming the Kalmyk people. Kara Kula of the Koros clan unified the Orats by the 1630s, and his son Erdeni Bachur Hongtaiji established the Dzungar Khanate in 1634. The title of Hongtaiji was given to him by the Dalai Lama. Topic. The Third Introduction of Buddhism Hudutai Sesan Hongtaiji of Ordos and his two brothers invaded Tibet in 1566. He sent an ultimatum to some of the ruling clergy of Tibet demanding their submission. The Tibetan supreme monks decided to surrender and Hudutai Sesan Hongtaiji returned to Ordos with three high-ranking monks. Tuman Jasatu Khan invited a monk of the Kagyu school in 1576. Following the advice of his nephew Hudutai Sesan Hongtaiji, Alton Khan of Tumut invited the head of the Gelug school Sanam Gyatso to his domain. Upon their meeting in 1577, Alton Khan recognized Sanam Gyatso Lama as a reincarnation of Phagpa Lama. Sanam Gyatso, in turn, recognized Alton as a reincarnation of Kublai Khan. 
Thus, Alton added legitimacy to the title, Khan, that he had assumed, while Sanam Gyatso received support for the supremacy he sought over the Tibetan Sangha. Since this meeting, the heads of the Gelugpa school became known as Dalai Lamas. Alton Khan also bestowed the title Asherdara, Osurdar from Sans Kr. Varadara to Sanam Gyatso. At the same time the ruler of Kalka Abtai rushed to Tumit to meet the new Dalai Lama. He requested the title Khan from him. Although the new Dalai Lama had already recognized Alton as a Khan in addition to the extant Mongolian Khan Tuman Jasatu, the Dalai Lama in Abtai's case rejected the request with the excuse that, There cannot be two Khans at the same time. After some hesitation however, he did give Abtai the title Khan. Abtai Khan established the Erdan Zoo Monastery in 1585 at the site of the former city of Karakoram. Thus, eventually most Mongolian rulers became Buddhists. Topic. Cultural Renaissance The second half of the 15th and the 16th centuries saw the revival and flourishing of Mongolian culture. This period is characterized by development of architecture, fine arts including silk applique, thangka, martang and nagtang painting, and sculpture. An adopted son of Orat aristocrat Baibagas, Zaya Pandita Namhejamtso (1599–1662), reformed the Mongolian script, adapting it to the Orat dialect. This new script is called Toto Bichig. Zanabazar (1635–1723), head of Buddhism in Kalka, was a great master of the Buddhist art. Along with the sculptures of the 21 Teras, he created the famous sculptures of Sita Tara and Sayama Tara, inspired by lively images of beautiful Mongolian women. The lotus flower over the left shoulder of Sita Tara is about to blossom and Sita Tara herself is in her mid-teens. The lotus flowers over the shoulders of Sayama Tara have already blossomed and Sayama Tara herself is a woman in the bloom of her beauty. She is aware and proud of her perfect beauty. She has awakened from her meditation, put down her right leg in the moment of standing up to descend from her lotus seat to breastfeed her child, and her children are the sentient beings. Many temples and monasteries were built under Zanabazar's projects. He designed the Soyumbo script for the Mongolian, Tibetan, and Sanskrit languages in 1686. Mathematician and astronomer Mingatu of Charade discovered nine trigonometric equations and wrote 42 volumes of the Roots of Regularites. Zvj Totlin Bv Ren A. Servals, five volumes in linguistics, Dun Yuhan, and 53 volumes of work on mathematics. In the area of historiography and literature, the Shiratuji was written in the 16th century, the Alton Tobchi of Lubsandanzan was written in the first half of the 17th century, and the Erdanin Tobchi of Sagan Sesan Hongtaiji, a descendant of Hutatai Sesan Hongtaiji, was written in 1662. In the 1620s, Sogtu Hongtaiji of Kalka wrote his famous philosophic poems and Legdan Hututu Khan had the 108 volumes of Kangyur and 225 volumes of Tengyur translated into the Mongolian language. A translation theory work, The Source of Wisdom was written under leadership of Rolbidorji, Yanya Hututu II. Topic. Qing dynasty Topic. Qing conquests of Mongolia In the early 17th century the northern Yuan dynasty was divided into three parts, the Khalkha, Inner Mongols and Buryats. By the end of the 17th century, the power of the all-Mongolian Khan had greatly weakened and the decentralized Mongols had to face the rising New Yurchin statehood on the east. The last Mongol Khagan was Ligdan Khan in the early 17th century. He got into conflicts with the Manchus over the looting of Chinese cities, and managed to alienate most Mongol tribes. In 1618, Ligdan signed a treaty with the Ming dynasty to protect their northern border from the Manchus' attack in exchange for thousands of tales of silver. Nurhachi Bagator Tanaran Slate who reunified the Yurchin tribes sent a letter to Ligdan Khan seeking alliance in fighting against the Ming dynasty. Ligdan denied the proposal mentioning that Nurhachi rules only three Tumans of the Yurchins while Ligdan himself is a Genghisid ruling the forty Tumans of the Mongols, and that Nurhachi had better refrain from disturbing the Chinese city's tributaries of him of Ligdan Khan. In response, Nurhachi held it necessary to remind him that the forty Tumans are long gone and there are perhaps some six Tumans of which only Shaharia recognizes Ligdan's power as Khan. 
Later Nurhaci managed to ally with the vassals of Ligdan Khan, the Taijis or princes of southern Khalkha, Horchin, Horlos, etc., who pledged to support Nurhaci in his wars against the Ming dynasty. However their first allied actions were against their own suzerain Ligdan Khan, who they defeated in 1622. By the 1620s, only the Shahars remained under Ligdan's rule. The Shahar army was defeated in 1625 and 1628 by the Inner Mongol and Manchu armies due to Ligdan's faulty tactics. Ligdan Khan occupied Tumut and Ordos in 1623 to forestall their absorption by the Manchu and advanced into the Manchurian lands in 1631. Nevertheless, Manchu ruler Hong Taiji, successor of Nurhaci, allied with the Inner Mongolian Taijis defeated him again in 1634 and sacked Hohat. The Manchus secured control over Inner Mongolia in 1632 and Ligdan's army moved to fight Tibetan Gelugpa sect, Yellow Hat sect forces. The Gelugpa forces supported the Manchus, while Ligdan supported the Kagyu sect, Red Hat sect of Tibetan Buddhism. Ligdan Khan died in 1634 on his way to Tibet when his troops were swept by an epidemic. Hong Taiji assumed the title of Khan of the Mongols in 1636, marking the conquest of Inner Mongolia. The Manchus, supported by the troops of the Inner Mongolian Taijis, conquered Ming China in 1644 and founded the Qing dynasty. Erdeni Bachur Hong Taiji of the Dzungar Khanate convened a congress of Western Mongolian Dzungars and Khalkhas in 1640 to ally their forces in struggle against increasing foreign aggression. The congress issued a Khalkha Orat law called the Great Code of the Forty and the Four, or Mongol Orat Code. Dachin Dorban Hoyer un Ike Sagaza. The Congress was attended by 28 rulers from Dzungaria, Khalkha, Kakunor, and Kalmykia. Tushietu Khan Gombodorji and Sesan Khan Sholoi were engaged in a conflict with the Manchu Qing dynasty, siding with Tengus Taiji of Inner Mongolia, who revolted against Qing rule in 1646. Chahan Dorji succeeded to Tushietu Khan's throne in 1665. Zasigtu Khan Norbo died in 1661 and rivalry started between his successors. This feud eventually involved Altan Khan, Tushietu Khan, and the Dzungar Khanate. The crisis continued for decades and evolved into a war between Khalkha and Dzungaria in 1688, leading to the conquest of Khalkha by Galdan Bashugtu Khan, king of the Dzungar Khanate, in the course of several battles in the Hange Mountains. In 1688, Galdan attacked Khalkha following the murder of his younger brother by Tashit Khan Chakandorj the main or central Khalkha leader and the Khalkha Orat War began. The head of the Khalkha Buddhism Bogda Zanabazar, the Khalkha Khans and nobles with thousands of their subjects moved in panic to Inner Mongolia, which had been integrated into the Qing dynasty. A few Khalkhas fled north of Outer Mongolia where Russia threatened to exterminate them if they failed to submit, but many submitted to Galdan Bashugtu. The Khalkha leaders sought Manchu aid in their feud with Galdan Bashugtu Khan while the Kangxi emperor of the Qing dynasty cunningly demanded that they become his vassals as a condition for his support. Galdan demanded that the Kangxi emperor cede him under Gagin Zanagazar and Tushietu Khan Chahandorji. The Kangxi emperor refused and decisive battle took place near Yulanbudan where Galdan was defeated and fled back deeper into Khalkha territory. The Dzungar throne was then seized by Galdan's brother, Sewing Rabton in 1689 while the latter was engaged in the war in Khalkha and this event made it impossible for Galdan to fight the Qing Empire. Galdan sent his army to liberate Inner Mongolia after defeating the Khalkha army and called Inner Mongolian nobles to fight for Mongolian independence. Some Inner Mongolian nobles, Tibetans, Kumul Khanate and some Mogolistan's nobles supported his war against the Qing Empire, however, Inner Mongolian nobles did not join the battle against the Manchus. The Kangxi Emperor organized a congress of the rulers of Khalkha and Inner Mongolia in Dolner in 1691 at which the Khalkha feudatories the Khalkha Khanate or Eastern Mongolia by Zanabazar's decision formally declared allegiance to the Emperor. However, Khalkha de facto remained under the rule of Galdan Bashugtu Khan. Chakandorj fought against the Russian invasion of northern Mongolia until 1688. Zanabazar struggled to bring together the Orats and Khalkhas before the war. Qing forces invaded Khalkha in 1696 and the Orats were defeated by the outnumbering enemy in a battle at Zun Mod at the river Terelj. Galdan Bashugtu Khan died in 1697 in the region of Kovd. 
There were three Khans in Khalkha of which Zasakt Khan Shar Western Khalkha leader was Galdan's ally. Setsan Khan Eastern Khalkha leader did not engage in this conflict. The Mongols who fled to Outer and Inner Mongolia returned after the war. Some Khalkhas mixed with the Buryats. Sewing Rabtan continued the war against the Manchus to liberate Eastern, Upper and Inner Mongolia after Galdan Bashugtu, however, his action against Galdan made Northern Mongols fight against Russia without the help of other Mongols. The Russian and Qing empires supported his actions because this coup weakened Western Mongolian strength. Mongolia encountered Russian expansion on her northern border in the 17th century. The Buryats had fought against Russian invasion since the 1620s. The well armed Russian Cossacks cruelly subdued the resistance of the Buryats and conquered the Baikal region in 1640 1650s. The uprisings of the Buryats were brutally crushed in 1658 and 1696. The Russians attempted to build Ostrogs in Kavsgal area, but they were quickly destroyed by the local population. The Buryat region was formally annexed to Russia by treaties in 1689 and 1727, when the territories on both the sides of Lake Baikal were separated from Mongolia. In 1689 the Treaty of Nurchinsk established the northern border of Manchuria north of the present line. The Russians retained Trans-Baikalia between Lake Baikal and the Argon River north of Mongolia. The Treaty of Kayakta along with the Treaty of Nurchinsk, regulated the relations between Imperial Russia and the Qing Empire until the mid-19th century. It established the northern border of Mongolia. Oka Buryats revolted in 1767 and Russia completely conquered the Buryat region in the late 18th century. Tesawang Rabtan stopped the eastern expansion of the Kazakh Khans, and also sent his general Ihe Sarandandov to conquer Tibet in 1716. His force was driven out by Qing troops in 1720, who then occupied Tibet. However, several attempts by the Qing dynasty to subjugate the Dzungar Khanate failed in the early 18th century. In 1723, the Qing troops subdued the uprising of Luvzindanzan Taiji in Kakunor. Sewing Rabtan was succeeded by his son Galdan Saran in 1727. Galdan Saran took a series of actions to develop of crop production, gardening, and cannon manufacture in Dzungaria. He successfully repelled the aggression of the Qing dynasty in 1729–31. Moreover, his general Baga Sarandandav advanced into Khalkha and reached the river Kerulan in 1732, but had to retreat after battles with Khalkha and Qing troops. Galdan Saran died in 1745 and a crisis arose among his heirs. After a series of bloody clashes among them, Dewachi, supported by Khoi Orat Prince Amorsana became the new Dzungar Khan in 1753. The feud was assigned to the Qing dynasty to prepare for the invasion of the Dzungar Khanate. As soon as he became Khan, Dewachi deprived his friend Amorsana of his wife and then defeated him in a battle in 1754. Amorsana sought an alliance with the Qing dynasty, hoping to defeat Dewachi and elevate himself to the position of Khan of the Dzungar Khanate. The Qing administration mobilized horses and other livestock of the Khalkha population for the Dzungar invasion. A 200,000-strong army consisting of Khalkha, Inner Mongolian, Manchu and Chinese troops invaded Dzungaria in 1755. The vanguard of the Qing army was led by Amorsana, King Chingunjiv and King Renchingdorji of the Khalkhas. The Dzungar Khanate was conquered by the Manchus in 1755-1758 due to conflicts between their leaders and military commanders. While this horde entered the Ili River basin, Amorsana captured Devachi and handed him to the Manchu. This event marked the fall of the Dzungar Khanate, which had impeded Qing expansion into Central Asia for over a century. The Qianlong Emperor demobilized the army and envisaged a congress of Dzungar and other Mongol aristocrats to celebrate the incorporation of Dzungaria into the Qing Empire. Soon after the conquest of the Dzungar Khanate, Amorsana, Chingunjiv of Kotogoid and Inner Mongolian Korchan Wang Sevdanbalgir rose up against Qing domination. Some Inner Mongol and Khalkha nobles supported this uprising but the second Jetsundamba Kututu and Tushiyetu Khan Yampildorji mysteriously died shortly afterwards. Chingunjiv rose against Qing rule in 1756 abandoning his post and appealed to the other nobles of Khalkha to rise for independence. Around the same period, an uprising of Sevdanbalgir in Inner Mongolia was subdued. Sevdanbalgir was arrested before this uprising to prevent the Inner Mongols uniting their force. 
He planned to organize a Congress of the Khalkha nobility to elect a future Khan of Mongolia. Chingunjiv was supported by Bogda Gagin II, the Khans of the four Khalkha Amags and other members of the nobility. However, the Qing court was able to capture Chingunjiv before the uprising took its full swing. Chingunjiv and his whole family were cruelly executed in 1757, and the Qing court decided that future Jetsundamba Kututis would be only found in Tibet, not in Mongolia. Renchingdorj Wang who allowed Amursana to abandon his post in the Qing army was cruelly executed in Beijing. Amursana returned to Dzungaria with his 500 warriors as he was deceived in his hope to take the Dzungar throne with the support of the Qing Empire. A faction of the Orat aristocrats elevated him as Khan of the Orats in 1756. However, Amursana's followers lacked unity. The decisive battle took place at Sharbal in 1757 when 3,000 Orat troops fought against a four times outnumbering enemy. After the 17-day battle, Amorsana was defeated and fled to Tobolsh in Russia where he died but the Dzungars continued their war against Manchu invasion until 1758. Brutally revenging the Orat people for their love for freedom, the Qing army carried out the Dzungar genocide, killing every Orat they met on their way in the territory of the Dzungar Khanate. Of the 600,000 Dzungar population, only 30,000 survived. Some scholars estimate that about 80% of the Dzungar population were destroyed by a combination of warfare and disease during the Qing conquest of the Dzungar Khanate in 1755–1758. Mark Levine, a historian whose recent research interests focus on genocide, has stated that the extermination of the Dzungars was "...arguably the 18th-century genocide par excellence." The territory of the Dzungar Khanate was then incorporated into the Qing Empire as Xinjiang, which later became a province. <inaudible> <inaudible> Mongolia under Qing rule After seizing control of Outer Mongolia, the Qing government grouped Khalkha Khoshans into four Amags province, Tusayetu Khan Imog, Zasatu Khan Imog, Sesan Khan Imog and Sein Noyan Khan Imog. In addition, the territories populated by Orats in the Kobdo region were grouped into Togs Huleg Dali Khan Imog and Unan Zorigtu Khan Imog. Amags were governed by Imog Congress Chigulgan comprising the lords of the Koshans. The Chigulgan Daruga official presiding the Congress was appointed from the Koshan lords by the Qing government. As vassals of Qing emperors, the Mongolian nobles, Rulers of the Koshans were expected to carry out military services commanding their troops in warfare, to personally attend the emperor in his hunting processions, mobilize resources from the Koshan population and subdue local riots. Their services were generously awarded by the emperor, and those who performed exceptionally outstanding feats before the Qing emperor would occasionally be honored to marry a princess. Disobedience or failure to provide adequate service was severely punished. The most heavy burden of the foreign exploitation was laid on the spine of the ordinary Mongolian laborers. They were impoverished during mobilization of horses and livestock products during preparation of the military campaign against the Dzungar Khanate, besides, they had to serve as warriors themselves. Although the military feudal system of Mongolia of the pre-Qing epoch is considered to have been a class society in which an ordinary Mongol was expected to obey his feudal lord as a soldier obeys a commander, it was during the Qing rule when serfdom was effectively introduced to the Mongolian society for the first time. There were three forms of serfdom, Albatu — state serfs, Komhilga — personal serfs of Koshan rulers and of Taijis, and Shabi — serfs of Kututis, supreme clergy. To prevent assimilation of the Mongols, the Qing government tried to restrict travels of Han Chinese to Khalkha and to forbid cross-ethnic marriages between the Mongols and Han Chinese. In the later Qing period however, the Qing policy changed with the new policies Xinjiang in the early 20th century, which called for the Sinification of Mongolia through Han Chinese colonization. <laughs> Modern period The official name of the state was IKH Mongol ULs, meaning the Great Mongolian State. Yuan Shikai, the president of the newly formed Republic of China, considered the new republic to be the successor of the Qing and hoped to integrate Outer Mongolia to the new republic. While the Qing referred to their state as Zongguo, the term for China. In modern Chinese, in official documents such as treaties, it implemented different ways of legitimization for different peoples in the Qing Empire, such as acting as Khan to the Mongols. 
As a result, the Mongols considered themselves as subjects of the Qing state outside China or Katedh, and the position of Mongols was that their allegiance had been to the Manchu Qing monarch, not the Chinese state. When declaring its independence the Mongolian government around the Bogod Khan replied to Yuan Shikai that both Mongolia and China had been administered by the Manchus, but after the fall of the Manchu Qing dynasty in 1911 it was simply that the contract about their submission to the Manchus had become invalid. Bogod Gagin was enthroned as Bogod Khan Holy King of Mongolia on 29 December 1911 and the era was titled Olana or Gugdigsen, elevated by many. The Qing high official in Uliastai was deported on 12 January 1912 in the presence of 700 Mongolian warriors mobilized from Sein Noyan Khan Imog. Mongolian troops led by Danbajansan Ya Lama, Magsurjiv, and the Manlebatar Damdinshuran arrived in the Khovd region in August 1912. After an intense attack supported by the local people, they captured the city of Kobdo during the night of 20 August 1912. At the same time, while many Mongol leaders outside Outer Mongolia sent statements to support Bogod Khan's call of Mongolian reunification, in reality however, most of them were too prudent or irresolute to attempt joining the Bogod Khan regime. The Mongolian army took control of Khalkha and the Khovd region modern UV's province, Khovd province, and Bayanolji province but northern Xinjiang the Altai and Ili regions of the Qing Empire, Upper Mongolia, Barga, and Inner Mongolia came under control of the Republic of China. On 2 February 1913 the Bogod sent Mongolian cavalrymen to liberate Inner Mongolia from China. The Russian Empire refused to sell weapons to the Bogod Khanate, and Tsar Nicholas II called it Mongolian imperialism. The United Kingdom urged Russia to abolish Mongolian independence because it was concerned that, if Mongolians gain independence, then Central Asians will revolt. 10,000 Khalkha Mongolian and Inner Mongolian cavalry about 3,500 Inner Mongols defeated 70,000 Chinese soldiers and controlled almost all of Inner Mongolia, but in 1914 the Mongolian army retreated due to lack of weapons. 400 Mongol soldiers and 3,795 Chinese soldiers died in this war. The Barga Mongols fought against Chinese forces in August 1912, captured the city of Hyler, and announced their willingness to unify with the Bogod Khanate. In its historical significance, the establishment of the Bogod Khanate of Mongolia is comparable with the foundation of the unified Mongol Empire in 1206. With national independence, Mongolia entered the path of modernization. A parliamentary structure consisting of two chambers, the Upper Hural and the Lower Hural, was formed in 1914. A legal code, Jarlig Yar Togtufajsan Mongol Ulus Un Hauli Zul Un Bichig or Zarligar Togtuzan Mongol Ulsan Kuli Zulan Bichig, was adopted in 1915. On 3 November 1912, the Russian Empire and Mongolia signed a bilateral treaty without the participation of China. This treaty meant recognition of the Bogod Khan as the monarch of the sovereign state of Mongolia by Russia. Nevertheless, under strong pressure from the Russian and Chinese governments, the Treaty of Kayakta between Russia, Mongolia, and the Republic of China downgraded the independence of Outer Mongolia to autonomy within China. The government of Mongolia maintained a position of preserving Mongolia's independence including Khalkha Mongolia, the Khovd region, Western Mongolia, Tuva, Inner Mongolia, Barga, and Upper Mongolia. The position of the Republic of China was that all of Mongolia was territories of China. The position of Russia was to reduce Mongolian independence to an autonomy limited to Outer Mongolia only. Negotiations continued for eight months as the Mongolian representatives firmly defended the independence of the country, but finally the government of Mongolia had to accept Russia's position. However, Outer Mongolia remained effectively outside the control of the Chinese, who on the other hand controlled Barga, Dzungaria, Tuva, Upper Mongolia, and Inner Mongolia in 1915. On 2 February 1913, Mongolia and Tibet signed a treaty of friendship and alliance. Mongolian agents and Bogod Khan he was a Tibetan disrupted Soviet secret operations in Tibet to change its regime in the 1920s. Following the Russian Revolution of October 1917, China revived its claims to Outer Mongolia, aiming at its conversion into a common Chinese province. 
In late 1919, the Chinese general Xu Shuzhang occupied Urga after suspicious deaths of Mongolian patriotic nobles and forced the Bogod Khan and the leading nobles to sign a document renouncing Mongolia's independence. Leaders of Mongolia's national independence movement, such as Magsurjev or Damdinshuren died in the prison under brutal torture were arrested and imprisoned. The Chinese had tightened their control of Mongolia by this time. Russian White Guard troops led by Baron Ungern von Sternberg, who had been defeated in the Civil War in Transbaikalian Siberia, invaded Mongolia in October 1920. Baron Ungern sought allies to defeat the Soviet Union. In October to November 1920, Ungern's troops assaulted the capital, Niazol Kure, known to Europeans under the name Urga, now Ulaanbaatar, several times but were repelled with heavy losses. Ungern entered contacts with Mongolian nobles and lamas and received Bogod Khan's edict to regain independence. On 2–5 February 1921, after fighting a huge battle, Ungern's force mainly Mongolian volunteer cavalrymen, Buryat and Tatar Cossacks of Russia drove the Chinese forces out of the Mongolian capital. One part of the Chinese forces fled to the south to China, and another to the north of Mongolia to enter negotiations with the Far Eastern Republic a puppet state created by Soviet Russia. The Bogod Khan's monarchic power and his government were restored. <laughs> Mongolian People's Republic Bogod Khan failed in his efforts to get aid from Japan and the United States for regaining the independence of Mongolia from China. Later the Chinese forces were defeated by Baron Ungern, but at the same time the Mongolian People's Party MPP had been established. The Soviet government saw this party as instrumental for driving Ungern's troops from Mongolia. The MPP was established in early 1921 as a merger of two underground revolutionary groups who had their own views on the future of Mongolia. One of these groups was headed by Solon Danzin, and the other group was headed by Bodu. They sought aid from the Soviet Union, which was unacceptable to Bogod Khan. However, for the sake of the country's independence, Bogod Khan endorsed the MPP's letter to the Soviet government. However, the Soviet Union chose not to respond to Bogod Khan's government, instead looking to the MPP to become the rulers of Mongolia. The Mongolian Revolution of 1921 began on 18 March, when 400 volunteer troops led by Sukhbadar attacked the 2,000-man Chinese garrison in Kayakta at the northern frontier of Mongolia. The Mongolian volunteer troops and units of the Soviet Red Army advanced to the south, annihilating the remainder of the defeated Chinese troops and Ungern's white troops. The main battles undertaken by the Mongolian troops took place at Tujin Nars against the Chinese and at Zelter and Bolnai against the white troops. Simultaneously, Cottonbatar Magsurjev, who had been sent by Baron Ungern to the western provinces, revolted and allied himself with the MPP. He defeated the white troops led by Kazantsev, Vandanov, and Bakic. Mongolian and Soviet troops led by Kazbadar and Baikalov withstood a long encirclement by the whites at Lake Tolbo in present-day Bayanol G. Imog. Baron Ungern, after a conspiracy, was deserted by his troops and captured by a detachment of the Red Army. The MPP troops and Russian Red Army troops entered Urga in July 1921. Thus the revolution ended Chinese occupation of Mongolia and defeated white Russian forces in Mongolia. Also that year, Mongolian revolutionary leaders adopted the statement of reunification of Mongolia. In 1924, during secret meetings with the Republic of China, the Soviet Union agreed to China's claim to Mongolia. The Soviet Union officially recognized Mongolian independence in 1945. The revolutionary government kept Bogod Khan as nominal head of state, but the actual power was in the hands of the MPP and its Soviet, especially Buryat and Kalmyk councillors. After the mysterious death of Bogod Khan in 1924, the MPP moved quickly to promulgate a Soviet-style constitution, abolishing monarchy and declaring the Mongolian People's Republic on 26 November 1924. Mongolia became completely isolated from the world by the MPP government, which followed the Soviet Union in implementing the communist experiment. On the other hand, this also provided protection against the potential aggression of China. In 1928, Mongolian politics took a sharp leftward turn. Herds were forcibly collectivized, private trade and transport were forbidden, and monasteries and the nobility came under attack. 
This led to an economic breakdown and to widespread unrest and armed uprisings in 1932. The MPP and Soviet troops defeated the rebels in October. But as a result, the MPP withdrew its most aggressively socialist policies, as advised by the Comintern, instead adopting the Sine Ergeltein Bodlago, Bodlago, the so called policy of the new turn. The new turn included the purging of the most leftist members of the leadership under the pretext of Nugala bending, and liberalized development of the economy, and was favored by new leaders such as Prime Minister P. Gendon. However, they did not realize that this was a temporary tactical retreat by Stalin and the Comintern. Another wave of repressions began in 1937, presided over by Korlugin Choibalsan, and resulted in the almost complete elimination of the Buddhist clergy. The Buryat Mongols started to migrate to Mongolia in the 1900s due to Russian oppression. Stalin stopped the migration in 1930 and initiated genocide in Mongolia against both immigrants and native Mongolians. During the Stalinist repressions in Mongolia many Buryat men and 22,000 to 33,000 Mongols were killed by Soviet orders. The victims were 3% to 5% of the total population, and included monks, pan-Mongolists, nationalists, patriots, military officers, nobles, intellectuals, and common citizens. Some authors also offer much higher estimates, up to 100,000 victims. At this time, Mongolia had an overall population of about 700,000 to 900,000 people. The proportion of victims to the total population was much higher than during the Great Purge in the Soviet Union. In 1939, Soviet and Mongolian troops fought against Japan in the Battle of Kalkin Gol, in eastern Mongolia. In August 1945, at the end of World War II, Mongolian troops took part in the Soviet operations against Japan in Inner Mongolia. Russian historian Viktor Suvorov wrote that in the Soviet war with Germany, Mongolian aid was as important as American aid, because warm clothes decided victory or defeat in the battles. Also in August 1945, the Republic of China had finally agreed to recognize Mongolia's independence if a vote were held. The vote took place in the presence of Chinese observers on 20 October. The official result was 100% for independence. After the 1949 communist victory in China, Mongolia had good relations with both of its neighbors. When the Sino-Soviet split developed in the 1960s, it aligned itself firmly with the Soviet Union. In 1960, Mongolia gained a seat in the UN, after earlier attempts had failed due to US and Republic of China vetoes. The post-war years also saw the acceleration of the drive towards creating a socialist society. In the 1950s, livestock was collectivized again. At the same time, state farms were established, and, with extensive aid from the USSR and China, infrastructure projects like the Trans-Mongolian Railway were completed. In the 1960s, Darkhan was built with aid from Soviet Union and other Comic-Con countries, and in the 1970s the Erdnet Combinate was created. Democracy. <inaudible> 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 A modest meeting organized by the Mongolian Democratic Union on 10 December 1989 landmarks the commencement of the democratic movement in Mongolia. The subsequent meetings involved ever-increasing numbers of supporters. A meeting with participation of 100,000 people took place on 4 March 1990 on the square at Cinema Yalalt, now known as the Square of Liberty. The meeting turned into a demonstration, marching to the House of the Government, which then hosted the People's Great Hurl, Council of Ministers and the headquarters of MPRP. The demonstrators demanded the resignations of the political bureau of the MPRP, a formation of a provisional People's Hurl during the month of March, and separation of MPRP from the government. They handed their petition to a representative of the government. Denial of these demands by the communist government led to a hunger strike of 7 to 10 March 1990 by a number of activists of the Mongolian Democratic Union resulting in the resignation of the political bureau of the MPRP and negotiations for political reforms. The first democratic election was held in July 1990. On 3 October 2002 the Ministry of Foreign Affairs announced that Taiwan recognizes Mongolia as an independent country, although no legislative actions were taken to address concerns over its constitutional claims to Mongolia. Offices established to support Taipei's claims over Outer Mongolia, such as the Mongolian and Tibetan Affairs Commission, lie dormant. 
Topic. See also. Topic. References. Topic. Further reading. Sanders, Alan J. K. 2010. Historical Dictionary of Mongolia. Scarecrow Press. ISBN 0810874520 Walter Heisig, Claudius Muller, Die Mongolen Exhibition Catalog, Munich 1989 as Mongolen Topic External links John Stuart Bowman Columbia Chronologies of Asian History and Culture Map of the Capital Districts of the Kidan Empire Map of the Kidan Period Kidans and Jurgens Dual Manichaeism in Uyghuria and Iran Realm of the Mongols Mongolia, Entry on Mongolia from the 1907 Catholic Encyclopedia Biography of Zanon Nabazar and History of Dissemination of Buddhism in Mongolia by Don Kroner History of Mongolia, Chronology and Details Face Music, History, Horsemen, Nomads The Zongnu Empire Maps History of Mongolia Prehistory of Mongolia Fossils found in Kenti Imog of Mongolia Might prehistoric rhinoceros dinosaurs from Mongolia as reported in 1924 Rock Art and Surface Archaeology of Mongolia, Baga Uyghur and Sagan Salah Petroglyphic Complexes of the Mongolian Altai High Altai, Central Asia, Petroglyphs, Prehistoric Rock Paintings Prehistoric Park, Mysteries of Prehistoric Mongolia Archaeological Sensation, Ancient Mummy Found in Mongolia Mongolia and the Altai Mountains, Origins of Genetic Blending between Europeans and Asians Prehistoric Bone Hats Found in Inner Mongolia Mongolia, Ten Prehistoric Sites Discovered Two Prehistoric Villages Found in Mongolia 4,000-Year-Old Prehistoric Portraits Discovered in Inner Mongolia New Prehistoric Discoveries in Alksa League, Inner Mongolia New Pre Prehistoric Discoveries in Alksa League, Inner Mongolia Paleocriti, A Guide to Prehistoric Animals Ordos Man and Inner Mongolia The Rock Art of Inner Mongolia and Ningxia China.